dawn at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And the heat of battle is just beginning. For the next few weeks, every decision, every move made by soldiers here at the Army's Joint Readiness Training Center will be scrutinized. I haven't heard anybody return fire yet following this contact. Uh, multiple RPG, IED, two vehicles here that can still be firing. Nobody's engaged anybody. Uh, they haven't really developed the situation, no tactical site exploitation or anything yet. Get ready to go. We take a 365, 454-day deployment, and we try to uh, cram a combat action into, you know, because you'll go weeks without a contact, and then you'll have that one brief firefight. We're trying to encapsulate that. And consequences similar to real-life combat situations. You still got rear security. Hey, hey, Hicks. Baskets, back them up. You got a sketch go. Right up. No, 10 feet. You got to move. You're too close. We're going to wear them out. They should be at least exposed to the concept of somebody looking down a barrel of a gun at them and pulling the trigger. Man down! It's the concept of, of being out there and, and, and seeing that enemy. They're going to be more comfortable working under pressure. It's not only the Army that is training here. We incorporate many different things, and examples of those are Special Operations Forces, Marine Special Forces. We have partners with other interagencies, your host nation security forces. Uh, we get close air support and airlift support for every rotation. There's a wide variety of things that they contend with in a real joint environment. This is the, uh, you know, bar none, the most realistic training that we're going to get in preparation for combat. Training has been the name of the game at this rural Louisiana base for more than half a century. Founded in 1941 and named after Confederate General and Louisiana Bishop, the Reverend Leonidas Polk, it was here and at a few surrounding bases that nearly half a million soldiers learned the basics of combat during the famous World War II Louisiana maneuvers, the largest pre-war exercise of its kind ever held in the United States. The post closed after the Korean War, but then reopened in 1961 during the Berlin Crisis to again provide infantry training, a mission which continued through the Vietnam War. And in March 1993, Fort Polk became the new home of the Joint Readiness Training Center. Throughout its history and to this day, this is the place where many soldiers have lived some of the most demanding moments of their lives. There is a saying that goes around here that the, the toughest day should be here at GRTC and not in, in Search Your Country. Uh, and the idea of being here at GRTC, the biggest compliment that we can get is that for the soldiers to come back from their deployment and say, my, my four or five days or my GRTC rotation was harder than my deployment downrange. To me, if they come back and say that, that means I've done my job and, and I've successfully prepared that soldier for deployment. So, just what constitutes a soldier's toughest day? How does one recreate the rigors of insurgent warfare and an enemy with increasingly unpredictable ways? Meet the Geronimos, here to create a day of pure hell. Believe it or not, these guys are actually U.S. soldiers, playing opposing force to units in training. They tossed their razors, uniforms, and temporarily transformed themselves into renegades. It's intense, so help these guys train stuff, so it's pretty good. I guess we have the advantage 
because we know what's going on. We usually know what the reactions are going to be. Hey, someone has it for it. In that corner right there is a doorway. You see that? Another doorway right in front of you. Right side! Can you fire on them? Someone has it for Smith? Well, I mean, we know they're going to mess up, and that's pretty much what they're doing here is they're coming here to learn, you know, certain mistakes so when they get there over in Iraq or Afghanistan, they don't make the same mistakes there. So we know they're going to screw up, so we're just giving them the training, and we just watch, and then they learn from what they made the mistakes here. Mistakes that could cost these soldiers their lives. No matter what's going on around you, you never take your eyes off this guy, okay? Take this scenario. So we're going to go back, get back on the road here. Members of a combat convoy are tasked with escorting a civilian truck from one base to another. The 18-mile journey, a simple, straightforward mission. Or so it seemed. My particular job today is to take my machine gun over there and shoot at them. And they won't know where we're going to be, so they won't really be expecting it. The first thing that I thought as soon as I saw that sand pit was this was going to be a perfect ambush area for the enemy. Uh, they always teach you that, you know, always look at the areas that you're traveling down and see if you were the enemy, if you would attack. And as soon as we pulled in, I said, if I was the enemy, this is where I would be. So I started looking for, for uh, signs first off. I noticed there was a little bit of uh, irregular brush on the top of the hill. And then as we drove around, we called back uh, to relay the message. At the end of the day, and a mission most involved originally considered a walk in the park, the tally of obstacles encountered went something like this. RPGs. Gunners. A myriad of casualties. Pump it twice! Pump it twice! And for some, frustration unparalleled. Use your f***ing f Put well, fire on his ass! Yeah. It was a mess. We need a lot of practice, but... Uh... We're getting there, definitely. I think I'm going to take uh, the idea that we have a impractical and uh, adaptable enemy, and that we need to make sure that no matter what happens, as we travel on our mission, that if we do get hit, we're prepared for whatever hits us. The unit showed uh, a lot of good uh, techniques, a lot of good procedures. Uh, this is their first time through this event. All this is uh, new to them, the first time they've seen it. And I think when we see this formation come through here again in a couple of days, we'll see a marked improvement um, as they've had the opportunity to work through these skills and these tasks again. Detailed assessments of the day's events will come in time. But for now, the soldiers in training are left with a lot to think about. A lot of people, like, including myself, haven't deployed, and this is as real as it's going to get, and you need to take everything seriously. Which was precisely the plan. I mean, you can never really replicate what's going to happen, but this is pretty good. This is Puli Alam, and it was represent a small village or a town in Afghanistan. And in this simulated Afghan village, there's an emergency. An Afghan woman, pregnant, in desperate need of medical attention. And the unit will come out here and hopefully assess her and identify, does she take to a local national hospital or back to the U.S. hospital to get her treated. And there'll be other things going on, but the uh, critical player is the medic, because he or she is the uh, expertise. Stepping up to the plate, the responding medic is 24-year-old Army Specialist Victoria Wortman. She's here to add specialized knowledge about Afghanistan to her experience from a previous deployment to Iraq. For the first couple of months, we really didn't see hardly anything at all, and just out of nowhere, we started seeing all kinds of patients, you know. And we did very well. We made a name for ourselves in Iraq. We had the best aid station in RAO. Still, 
She knows her job today will not be an easy one. I need to watch what I'm doing, how I'm presenting myself, because in their culture, they don't look on women too highly. They expect women to be quiet. So I need to watch what I do and how I present myself to these cultural people so that I don't upset them. Hey, I need a... Worthman, come here. I need a team, Sergeant Major. I need a team now. And a litter. I need someone we can get her out of here. We I'm authorized to move at this time. Troop with you on the spot. Despite Specialist Workman's untiring efforts to overcome this desperate situation, she alone cannot determine the final outcome. What I need is the doctor to come over here. When her team fails to provide timely assistance, the situation escalates. If they're taking their time and not moving fast enough, she likes to go into shock. And then the reaction around her, the civilians will feed off of her. Then, spirals out of control. They'll go from peaceful protests up to riot, and it just becomes more difficult as the unit remains in this area. In the days and hours to come, the unit that responded to the Puli Alam emergency will receive plenty of review and feedback. When I was trying to get an instate of, I was giving you low respirations and a low pulse. The instate I wanted was to get the patient evacuated. That was the instate I wanted. I know you talked to the Sergeant Major. I even kind of gave you a little push to say, hey, you're the medic on the scene. It's your scene. It's your patient. You take charge. You tell them what you need, what you want. The lessons learned from drills such as the Puli Alam emergency, where U.S. soldiers are forced to cross cultural barriers and interact closely with Afghans and Iraqis, are among the most important Fort Polk has to teach. Everything we do is about the people. It's absolutely paramount. We, we can train and provide the best uh, combat force that you can uh, imagine. I mean, we are the best in the world today. There is nobody who has bettered us in combat operations. And in every battle that we've been engaged with, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have won. And we will continue to win. But that will never win the war. Uh, the war cannot be won by military force alone. Uh, it just won't. And so the idea that we need to become more culturally attuned and aware of where we're operating, uh, we need to engage more with the population. Tell her that she needs to Don't get on your left hand. Wait. The complexity of the urban environment, the uh, political, religious, and ethnic tensions really bleed throughout. So it's more than just a security operation with the area you're operating in, but more so you're looking at governance, you're looking at development, you're looking at building the capacity and capability of the, the security forces, the host nation security forces in the area. This pivotal point is reinforced again and again as soldiers in training make their way through the dozens of makeshift homes, farms, and mosques at the mock Afghan and Iraqi towns scattered throughout the training center. We'd love to have your villages come out and, like, as, as, as soon as possible. Like, uh, uh, the more tribal, uh, the more traditional cultures, it's about personal, long-term relationships. I'm not going to make any progress until you and I develop a relationship of trust. Not of capitulation between either one of us, but of trust between the two of us, that, that my word is my deed, and then if I tell you something, it's going to happen. In late 2001, Cultural awareness training at the JRTC took on a new intensity with the founding of Engagement University, the place where Army leaders spend five or six days learning the cross-cultural skills they'll need to negotiate, interact, and build relationships effectively in Afghanistan and Iraq. This type of training hasn't always been embraced by its participants. Our leaders, uh, really at every level, approach the problem as one of, I have the weapons, I have the soldiers, I have the authority, and in one way or the other, things are going to go my way. I'm going to direct what happens here. And in some ways, they're exactly the audience we're looking for. We're looking for those individuals who are still focused on purely lethal approach to the problem, who don't respect the cultural issue, and we're trying to help them understand you have to be absolutely capable of lethal operations, and simultaneously, you must be capable of cross-cultural communications to effectively lead this to a political solution without having to bring a gun into the equation.
and I'm willing to do other things within your culture to do the apology. In this exercise, Major Patrick Cyber is in the hot seat, meeting with leaders of an Afghan village after a nine-year-old girl was hit by a U.S. military vehicle and seriously injured. I would like to go meet with the family, and I am prepared to, pr to present compensation to the family. Every word Major Cyber utters, every move he makes, is monitored and scrutinized by a team of observer controllers. This is part of counterinsurgency warfare, and that's what we're focusing on now. We're learning how to, how to fight this. We were good at this at one time uh, as, an, as an army, and now we're having to relearn it. So this is all part of that. And as always, there's lots of follow-up. And, and there was a little fumbling as far as with the weapon. When I first came in here, was said, well, Part of the Afghan culture is, if you're in their house, they're going to protect you. And so I didn't need to have my weapon. Uh, and because it is insulting to them, is that, well, if you're in my house, why do you need to have a weapon? And so trying to figure out, well, what do I do with it? I walked in here with it, and I know they don't want me to have it. Well, what's that going to look like? You know, you obviously recovered nicely from it um, in the actual engagement, but there was a little, I believe, a kind of an awkward moment from my um, observations in terms of, you know, getting that taken care of. Well, that was the thing that we, that we learned here is that it, it's about building the relationships. It's about working with people. And we are ambassadors, and we need to learn about the, the culture and the, the people and how to uh, help them solve the, the problems that are there. So, I, I wanted to communicate something to the, Af to the Afghan people. We get continuous, repetitive feedback from the leadership and the same thing from the soldiers while they're here. If you ask them when they finish up, they'll tell you the most eye-opening and probably the most valuable thing they did was come here, sit in a room, and, uh, and pitch your wits against the role players that are here. What makes the engagement university experience and the overall JRTC encounter so invaluable is the realism of the exercises here, an authenticity that's due largely to the hundreds of Afghan American and Iraqi American role players who volunteer at Fort Polk. After all, they know the peculiarities of their country and cultures better than anybody. We welcome you to our village and we are ready to answer any kind of questions you have. For the sake of families still in Afghanistan, some role players asked us not to show their faces. But if the risk of supporting this training is so high, why get involved at all? We know that uh, the fact that Americans are helping to eliminate the enemy of Afghanistan. So anybody who wants to help us, we are their friend. Nowadays, Americans are helping our country and would like to be uh, as full as possible to facilitate their success. And that's why we are here to uh, be with the army and to uh, tell them what our culture is so they can approach our people in the right way. That's why we are here. Throughout these mock Afghan camps and villages, you can hear similar stories. Afghans who once left their homes now doing what they can so their homeland will one day prosper. Because we want to help uh, the American Army and also the first of all we ha help to my people and, 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 and this will be good for my country. There are few who would question the realism these role players bring to the JRTC experience. Be they Afghan American or Iraqi American, their contributions have left an impact. Typically the first of five comments that will come back every single time is engagement university was the most productive training that I did at the CTC. Don't stop and in fact double that effort. Take a ride along any of the pine lined streets of Fort Polk or through one of the Joint Readiness Training Center's simulated Iraqi and Afghan villages, and it's easy to forget you're in southern Louisiana. I mean, you can never really replicate what's going to happen, but this is a pretty, pretty good. We send uh, our fire markers or people that um, use the battlefield effects, so there's many different explosions. Uh, 
a VBID or a car bomb is very similar to what you see in theater, um, however safe. There's IEDs, suicide vests, indirect fire, and the battlefield effects people have gone through training to better replicate um, the type of blast and concussion that they would see in theater, obviously without the effects. But for all the mock explosions, simulated attacks, and convincing effects, realism is just one of the many components needed to properly prepare a soldier. A second, all-important element, relevance. We routinely send folks from the operations group into theater to spend time in both Iraq and Afghanistan for two to three months. We have permanent LNOs that are in theater that provide us real-time feedback. And then from theater, the commanders in theater actually have a pretty aggressive program of having video teleconferences with us to provide lessons learned over time. And you look at the cadre of the observer controllers that are assigned here, most of them are right out of theater within the last six months to a year. Uh, they're brought in here and then they sit there and coach, teach, and mentor those who are preparing to go. And so they're bringing back their own personal experiences and injecting that into the training program here. Red four, Roger. And it's those experiences that directly influence the flavor of training here. This system of constant adjustment to meet the precise needs in the war zone is a prime example of the changing face of Army combat training. Compare this to training near the start of World War II. Remember the famous Louisiana maneuvers we mentioned earlier? Legend has it, many soldiers used broomsticks and wooden posts for rifles. To simulate attacks, Army pilots flying overhead dropped paper bags of flour on the soldiers below. Not exactly a precise replica of what World War II combat would be like, but nevertheless, the Louisiana maneuvers involving more than 400,000 soldiers would go down in U.S. history as the big one, the pinnacle of all U.S. Army pre-war training operations. When you take a look at all the equipment, assets, the details that go into supporting a unit at the JRTC, it's obvious combat training has come a long way. And the U.S. Army is eager to get the word out because I'm not sure the American public always fully understands the degree to which we go to try to replicate and prepare our young men and women before we put them in harm's way. Here's my litmus test for a successful rotation. I want every counterpart, so in my case again, the brigade commander, to look his counterpart OC in the eye and say, I would not have been prepared for combat if I didn't come to JRTC. That is my litmus test. A lofty challenge. Perhaps that explains the motto you can find posted at most every corner here at Fort Polk and the Joint Readiness Training Center. Forging the warrior spirit, in my opinion, it's making those soldiers trained in, in those tasks that soldiers should be, uh, what we would really think of when you think of, of an Army soldier. Here, they get that chance to train all those tasks. It's not necessarily something they can do at home station. And bottom line, once you go through a rotation at GRTC, you, you truly are uh, a trained soldier at that point, ready for deployment. All right, let's go. We're good. Exposed to the concept of somebody looking down a barrel of a gun at them and pulling the trigger. Sam down! It's the concept of, of being out there and, and, and seeing that enemy. They're going to be more comfortable working under pressure.
dawn at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And the heat of battle is just beginning. For the next few weeks, every decision, every move made by soldiers here at the Army's Joint Readiness Training Center will be scrutinized. I haven't heard anybody return fire yet following this contact. Uh, multiple RPG, IED, two vehicles here that can still be firing. Nobody's engaged anybody. Uh, they haven't really developed the situation, no tactical site exploitation or anything yet. Get ready to go. We take a 365, 454 day deployment and we try to uh, cram a combat action into, you know, because you'll go weeks without a contact and then you'll have that one brief firefight. We're trying to encapsulate that and consequences similar to real-life combat situations. Night as Polk, it was here and at a few surrounding bases that nearly half a million soldiers learned the basics of combat during the famous World War II Louisiana maneuvers, the largest pre-war exercise of its kind ever held in the United States. The post closed after the Korean War, but then reopened in 1961 during the Berlin Crisis to again provide infantry training, a mission which continued through the Vietnam War. And in March 1993, Fort Polk became the new home of the Joint Readiness Training Center. Throughout its history, it's not only the Army that is training here. We incorporate many different things, and examples of those are Special Operations Forces, Marine Special Forces. We have partners with other interagencies, your host nation security forces. Uh, we get close air support and airlift support for every rotation. There's a wide variety of things that they contend with in a real joint environment. This is the, uh, you know, bar none, the most realistic training that we're going to get in preparation for combat. Training has been the name of the game at this rural Louisiana base for more than half a century. Founded in 1941 and named after Confederate General and Louisiana Bishop, the Reverend Leonidas